Good morning, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This is episode 28, and I'm rejoined by John Stasevich. He's an independent candidate running for the president of the United States in 2024. And also with John is CJ Rapp. He's the director of marketing on John Stasevich's campaign. And we're also joined by Jason Page, who will more than likely be in the background, but he is the video and audio technician for John's campaign. Welcome all three of y'all to the show and thanks for accepting the invitation. Thanks for having us. Appreciate the uh, invite. No problem. Um, I have quite a bit to talk about today. There's gonna be a, a more or less an interactive tool with this today. So if anyone in the audience wants to join this um, live, this podcast, you can. If you have any answers and questions for, for John comments, anything you want to direct, towards John and his campaign. Um, we have some of his people here with him on the call. So you all can chat on YouTube. You can send something to my Facebook. You can send something to John's um, communication platforms and we will take care of you and try to get your answers um, solved. But anyway, I wanna give a couple of ads before we start this um, episode 28. This forum has really grown a lot. We've reached 33 different countries. And the goal is to reach 100 different countries at the end of 2023. This is quite an international podcast, but we do have a domestic audience, obviously. But the whole point of this podcast is to educate. And we do dedicate a lot of effort into politics and culture. I don't think you can separate the two, really, because you have to inform the people so that they can make more um, informed decisions. And... I think that the form is going in the right direction. I don't want it to grow too fast, but it's growing more or less on our terms. And we will talk about some of the guests coming down the road after this interview is over. But again, I appreciate everyone that's watching us now, listening to us, and I hope you enjoy this conversation with John and his team. I do have a question since um, we have CJ on the call with John. And as far as I know, CJ has a lot to do with the with developing the website, um, John's official webpage, which I'm going to link at the end of the description. What goes into designing this website? And I know we've talked a lot about ballot assets. That's been a huge concern for independent third party candidates. Um, what does CJ have to do with the website development? And what can we see going down the road as far as more development from the website and the ballot assets coalition? Well, let me explain the Ballot Access Coalition. I'll turn it over to Clark for the detail. The Ballot Access Coalition is a group of volunteers. Um, basically, our campaign designed the tools for him that Clark is going to talk about. But the idea is not just to get me on the ballot in all 50 states, but to help all independents and third parties um, candidates get on the ballot so that we can replace those that are in the duopoly. It seems that duopoly has the monopoly on political power. And it flips from Democrats to Republicans and then back again. But in order to end the corruption in our government, the way we view it is you have to have people who can replace them. So this ballot access coalition is self-directing and self-sustaining. Um, it's uh, And so it should last long beyond my campaign. In fact, they could expand. It could become a nonprofit. Who knows where it's going to go? But the idea is to level the playing field so that uh, regular working class people can actually serve in public office. I think they have a better handle on what life is like for, for working class people. And I think we'll have better policies as a result of that. And I really think we have to end the monopoly that the duopoly has. And so that's the purpose. And I'll let Clark go into the details on what he's done. He's done a lot of work on this as, as well as other people in our team. Well, thank you. Um, quite frankly, the uh, website is the hub of everything. Um, that's where you want to direct your web traffic and, and such to for nothing else, a contact form or, or simply to become aware of, of uh, what's what's ha happening and being presented. Uh, it's kind of like the 24-hour salesman, uh, the, the uh, showroom that's always open. So that's kind of the concept. But uh, So then you have to build your distribution network, and, and that's where we are. I mean, we've got all the bases covered. Uh, we're just starting to, you know, really post a lot and try to get engagement. Um, I'm building a team, but we don't have the foot soldiers, uh, which are really volunteers. Uh, so anybody interested in politics who loves Facebook or Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, 
to a degree. Tumblr is, you know, really a pretty cool uh, platform. It does amazing rendering. You, know, you put a URL in there and it does all the work for you. It's kind of cool. So, you know, that's one of the things why a website is important. Uh, the links that you can get. If you visit uh, johnstasevich2024.com, for example, we do have a media page, a social media page with all of our links and everything. So you can join in, you can follow, you can like, you know, which, which is important. Um, we've had two press releases that I was in charge of, uh, and, and we've gotten some nice bumps from that. Um, it's unfortunate that the, the mass media uh, is still kind of, you know, too far from the party. And the key that we're working on uh, with the uh, Ballot Access Coalition, we commonly refer to it as EAC, uh, is designed, quite frankly, to, to collaborate with the concept of uh, ranked choice voting. And uh, if people have been following things in Alaska, there was a huge upset by a very popular certain individual, basically got their butt kicked by a, a much better candidate. Uh, and, and without that ranked choice voting, you know, um, we move further and further away from democracy, in, in my personal opinion. Uh, and, and freedom. What is freedom? It's quite simply choices. You know, how many choices do you have? You know, um, how, how, how narrow is the path and, and how, how narrow minded are the members of that path? And that's why I support the John Stasevich campaign and doing, you know, the, the work and helping build the teams uh, to, to get the word out. And that's really what we need is we need participation. Uh, even if it's posting things, you know, memes, I've been creating a lot of memes and you'll see those out there. Um, pick them up, share them, you know, if, help us drive traffic to the website, uh, to join our committees. Uh, the way BAC works, you go to the state coalitions uh, and those are groups. The, the website is basically designed as a forum type site, similar to Facebook and, and a lot of the other social medias out there. So you'll be able to share information, videos, images, text, links, you know, uh, it's, but it's, it's contained with a specific, I guess, ideal of promoting the independent nonpartisan candidate. Uh, people that are really interested in, in really coming up with solutions and collaborating. Coming from the digital marketing field uh, and industry, you know, if, if you can't collaborate, if you can't be a team player, get a job at the car wash, man. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, Clark, your yeah. microphone seems to be going in and out. I don't know if there's anything you can do to adjust that better. I don't uh, just mention yeah, it. Went in a few, it went in and out a couple of times. Um, oh, sorry about that. It might be a know, connection. I, I have some follow ups um, based on what CJ was saying. Um, you mentioned something about the visibility aspect, and that's just from an outside perspective. Um, I try, to, I only platform people who run under the minor party banner or independent, unaffiliated banners. I don't platform Democrats and Republicans explicitly for political campaigns for a reason, because they already have the spotlight precisely for those reasons. I don't spotlight those types of candidates. I, sp I spotlight people like you, uh, John Stasevich, Brittany Jones, Hashaki Nichols, and, and there are gonna be various others that come on the platform to discuss their political um, policies and stuff down the road. I noticed that the press releases or I guess, I don't know what these companies are. I think one is EIN, and um, there's another one's called Web PR or something. PR Web. I don't see any mainstream media or any other type of press really picking up on this campaign or other campaigns for that matter. And how do you curve those situations? How do you get around the, the intentional suppression of your political campaign and others who are running as independents and unaffiliated how do you continue to get your broadcasting and messaging out to the public? Well, you know, at some point, we're probably going to have to deploy uh, disruption, you know, uh, just to get the word out and get the attention. It, it seems to be the only way you can get into the mainstream media anymore. Um, you know, if you're if, if 
John was running locally in Michigan as a, as a state representative or, or even a congressional representative or senator or whatever, he would probably, believe it or not, get more traction because it's more localized. But when you jump into things at a national level or an international level, um, again, from a digital marketing perspective, the, the uh, SEO and, and everything gets a lot more competitive. We've done a good job with you know, getting John's name out there. If you if you Google John Stasevich or uh, independent candidates 2024, we're, we're coming up, but there's not a whole lot of, of interest yet. But I think um, as we get closer into the election cycle, the rank choice voting is gonna become a more and more of an issue um, because people, you know, for the most part, I don't care what your what your political stripe is. We're all pretty much intelligent, you know. Um, we have families. Uh, the things that are most important to us, are, quite frankly, is our well-being, a family's well-being, and our community's well-being. So the whole national thing is is you know it's like this huge matrix manipulation of information and and priorities and everything. At some point, I hope people realize and dig a little deeper that there's a lot more people like John out there that don't want to be stereotyped as this or that, or, you know, I, I, I like this single wedge issue and, and I know I can win despite all the other baggage I bring along that I don't have to talk about, but, you know, the systems, the system needs fixed. Yes, um, John, I want to get your opinion on the matter. And then I have a follow-up based on what CJ just said about ranked choice voting and some of these other alternative systems that we have outside of what we use right now which is this um basically majority rule type of um angle well certainly the mainstream media through exclusion keeps independents and third-party candidates out of the limelight it's a technical challenge it's a it's a personal challenge it's a political challenge for for us um which is why the Ballot Access Coalition actually is so important to us. Uh, we expect the Ballot Access Coalition, we have 130 volunteers now, and we need state coordinators in every single state, and I would say multiple state coordinators. And they can go right down to the district level so that when every state, as you know, has a different set of rules for ballot access. Maybe they have a petition that you have to sign, maybe there's a petition and a fee, there's a window of opportunity in each state, which you have to get so many signatures and have to turn them into the Secretary of State. So CJ has set up the website for the BAC for these members to get together and join together. And then a guy named Jay Spencer, he's our director for that. And we need multiple national directors. We need multiple regional directors, directors and we need uh, multiple state directors. So I envision this as being a... Uh, something that again goes way beyond my campaign and i think is more important uh, frankly than my campaign because it's a movement it's a movement to get true representation in government which is what we're lacking today i think most people recognize the fact that our government works for those who fund it and those two parties get their funding from the same capitalist oligarchs and uh, multinational corporations they're the ones that drive the agenda so we literally have no voice in government as that Princeton study proved, when they compare polling of the public to what we actually get in legislation, we essentially get nothing that we want. And corporations, they don't even get everything. They get about 70% of what they want. But, uh, you know, the, the think tanks, these the legislation is written by lobbyists in think tanks and then handed to these representatives that these multinational corporations own and told to pass it. And they know they better do it. Because if they don't, they aren't going to have money to, for their next election cycle in their campaign. And so the whole system is corrupt. And the only way to get around it that I could figure out is to put together something like the Ballot Access Coalition. And it's one of the reasons I decided to run for the very top political job, because the president has very unique powers that other politicians wouldn't have. So even if I ran as a senator and I won, I'd be one out of 50 and I couldn't really make a big dent. But one for me as president is to get the corruption out of the system. We don't want any money in the system. We would challenge every single representative to put together an amendment to amend the Constitution, demanding only public funded elections. In other words, 
once the public is funding the elections and they own the politicians and they don't have to worry about money, they won't be on a phone all the time dialing for do dialing for dollars. They'll be able to actually present representation and that's going to help the community. Are We're talking about your volunteer work. You have 130 people that work for the ballot assets coalition and you all are trying to get more state directors and stuff. Um, I guess my follow up with what your concerns are and trying to get more volunteer work. There are organizations that are doing stuff that's very similar to that, that are trying to implement ranked choice voting and other alternative systems across the country. Have you reached out to groups like Rank the Vote or Free and Equal Elections? Have you reached out to those types of people? I have people who are reaching out to them. I mean, I can't personally reach out to everybody, but anyone that has a connection to any other group, that's why we called it a coalition mm -hmm. rather than the John Stasvich Ballot Access Initiative. That's what we started with. We started with an initiative to get me on a ballot. And then I realized that even if I won, that's not going to solve the problem. I mean, even though the president has a lot of power and it's a, you know, it's something I think that the, the American public needs to own that office, uh, not the oligarchs. But even if I won, I felt that the real change has to become, come from Congress. We have to turn over the Congress. We have to turn over the court. We have to get all the money out. And you need people to replace those people who refuse to work and serve for anything less than their own well-being, their own wealth, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, so to me, the Ballot Access Coalition is actually more important in my campaign. It's a, it's a part of a much larger movement. Um, of course, I'm in it to win it. I'm in it until the very end, no matter what. I am not going anywhere. I believe in what we're doing. I have a lot of people and a team that also believes in what we're doing, knows what the problems are. And I mean, across the political spectrum, it doesn't matter whether they're libertarian, uh, corporate uh, Republicans, MAGA, uh, corporate Democrats, uh, those that call themselves progressive Democrats, socialists, communists, across the political spectrum, people realize that the public's well-being, the health and well-being of our children and our families, our communities, our nations, and really all of humanity, those needs are being placed below the needs of the multinational corporations and the oligarchs. And we see that end result in a, a much greater wealth and income divide. And then, you know, there have been groups, as you know, who have not had representation almost forever system systematically and that would include native americans uh people of color uh immigrants who i feel contribute greatly to our society but have not reaped the benefits that even uh now i i you know i hate to use the word white privilege but the fact of the matter is i was born in a family that had some didn't have to face those systemic challenges that these other groups did. And so relatively speaking, I was privileged. Okay, that's just a fact. I didn't have to have a talk with my children about, you know, what it meant to be a colored person walking down the streets and having others judging them just based on the color of their skin, which is absolutely insane and ridiculous in my mind. And I think in most people's minds too. But there are systemic issues that have been put in place to keep these communities uh, uh, repressed in terms of voting um, and political. And then, so that's why we have these, the, the identity politics that the two parties play, because they want to they wanna make it look like they're inclusive. You know, they have to create that appearance, but it's not real. And you know it's not real based on the legislation and the end result. I mean, black families, as an example, have 30% of the wealth of white families. Well, that just can't be a coincidence. How the heck does that happen? Well, it happens because of redlining that, you know, part of our history. It happens because of slavery that was a part of our history. There's so many pieces to that um, that led to that end result. And so we want, we want our representatives to represent all of our people. The presidents from both parties have always promised, once I become president, I'm going to represent everybody. I have to represent all of the American people, but they don't. None of them do. And they've never been able to unite us in our common interests. The minute that a Democrat 
is elected or a Republican is re- elected, automatically half of society is against them. So they've divided it into the camps. I argue that the two parties are really only one party because they, they're funded by the same multinational corporations. So that no matter which party wins, the oligarchs, the multinational corporations, they always win. So, but they have to create this illusion of choice because the people felt they didn't have a choice. So they created two parties and they create wedge issues specifically designed to divide the working class. So I look at this as a class struggle. Um, and I want to unite people of all races, all backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, uh, rather than I want them to put the, the things that unite us that are most important to us, which is the health and well-being of our children and our families. I want them to put that first above all those other wedge issues. Those other issues we can work on later. And then, you know, I mean, uh, reparations is a wedge issue. That actually, that issue, you say the word reparations, nobody actually understands exactly what that means. And so it's been instrumental in dividing the working class against ourselves. So some people who are feel like white men, who feel that they aren't getting what they used to get, and they feel like they're now being deprived. And, and so they look at that as, wait a second, why is it that, uh, you know, poor, well, why, why would the black community get reparations? What about, what about me? What, what's in it for me? And so it ends up being a divisive issue. Really, what we want is a government that supports all of our people. And we all have the same needs and we all have the same interests. I would like policies that create such equality of opportunity that reparations becomes a non-issue. That's where I come from. And do I think there should be reparations? I actually do. I do think there should be reparations. I just don't know exactly what form that would take. And so I want an open, transparent government that has open um open discussions, big public open discussions to figure out how do we get our balance back in the society? I don't know exactly how to do it. And I think there are a lot of different people that have good ideas about how to do that. Now, do we target reparations at a community? We look at the community as a whole and we say, well, they need better schools. They need better infrastructure. They need better jobs, you know, so is it is it something that's targeted at a community or is it targeted to an individual family? How do we do that? And so there's a lot of different ways to probably get equality of opportunity. Um, and I want to I want a open, transparent government c- that can discuss these issues. Immigration is another divisive issue. Abortion is a divisive issue. I don't think I don't know anybody who says, hey, you know what we want to do is have a bunch of uh, uh a bunch of pregnant women who don't want their children and have to abort them. I would say, well, what, you know, what caused that? What is the cause of having someone that is pregnant that doesn't want to have that child or, or doesn't feel they could raise that child? They're not prepared. And therefore they look at abortion as a, as an answer. Uh, it's certainly, I, I raised a daughter and I have granddaughters. So they were conditioned and educated in a way they understand that, you know, uh, the responsibility of parenthood. And so they've been taught to avoid that. And if they are going to engage to, to use the technical tools we have, when I was young, you used to go, like, if, if guys want to, you know, they, if, if, the, if you decide to, to, that you're going to engage in sexual activity, they would go to the drugstore to get condoms back in, in the day. Well, the condoms were kept behind a druggist counter. And so you had to walk in and and go to a druggist to get permission to get this. And that could have avoided a lot of um, abortions because the the young girls who got pregnant back then, you know, I, I mean, I was around before abortions were legal and women were losing their lives. They were going into the alleys and into the streets and underground abortions. It was terrible. And so then we started going into abortion and then the, then the religious community really took hold of that. And they want to lower the number of abortions. We all agree on that. We want to lower the number of abortions, but the question is, how do you do it? So these wedge issues divide us is the bottom line. And we need to come together and own our government. Those issues can be worked out, but we need to go to the root cause of them. Don't let them divide us. 
uh, a people divided can't possibly thrive and prosper and succeed in a world where there's so much need. We all need to be working together, right? Mm -hmm. We could talk later on about capitalism. I've got a lot to say about that as well, but. I, I do, I, I have some questions based on the comments. It was interesting how you talk, you do focus a lot on unity in your campaign, just looking at your site. And um, I, I like the way your site is set up or whatever, just like, I, I think from a graphic level to the messaging on the site, I think that there's a lot of good cohesion there. But but I think there are some conflicting messages as well. And um, I want to kind of get to that because a lot of what you stand for, like I totally can understand. And I can see how you can have a message that unifies a lot of different groups of people. Um, I totally disagree that reparations is a wedge issue. I think that that's, a, that's quite a dismissive statement. I think that's something, I just don't think that you're really educated on reparations. And I think that that's something where there are people that have whole studies on reparations. Um, David Mills, I tried to get him on the show, but he didn't want to come on the show because his publication after George Floyd, um, he just didn't want to, he didn't want to be visible, but he wanted his ideas to sort of speak for themselves. And it talks about how um, Black Americans basically, um, the work was over $16.5 trillion. And if you compare that to the GDP of most countries, the the wealth that was lost from the free labor of African Americans, you know, I mean, it, it really helped to this economy. So there's monetary evidence of um, people are doing studies on the actual amounts of money. And then after that, you can talk about how you can divide the money within the population and stuff like that. But I think it's the idea of just like, it is a complex situation, reparations is, for instance. I don't think it's a wedge issue because it's complicated. It's a complicated issue, I think. I don't think it's a wedge issue because if you say that it's a wedge issue, I believe you're losing. I think the poll in 2020 was three-fourths of Black voters support reparations. So I think you're losing pretty much most of your Black support if you say a statement like that. I think it's um, you have to reach out to people who or um, talking about reparations and like actually studying this, like Sandy Darity, um, David Mills, who I just mentioned, that mm -hmm. that different thoughts of reparations. Though you have some people who have they operate with reparations under a capitalistic mindset, and for me that defeats the purpose. Kind of going to what you were saying, and then you have some people that see it more as like, okay, no, this is a dead old, and it's more about helping equitably the people. I mean, just citing all these statistics, like 40% of Blacks are homeless in the country, 40% are in the prison system. So those are obvious disparities that didn't come out of the blue. They didn't come out of thin air. So we know that reparations are needed because we cite statistics all day long about how Black people are not socioeconomically up to par the way they should be because of things that they can control. So that's, to me, an admission that reparations are needed is just how do we get to that point A to point B? I totally can see how that can be a complex issue. But I guess my second question will be, how do we- Well, can I, can, I, can I respond to that? Yeah, you can. Yeah, sure, definitely. And then I have okay. a question about something you mentioned earlier about unifying people. Okay, let me respond to the, the whether or not it's a wedge issue. You said that three quarters of the black community agree with it, okay? Right. And the black community is 14% of the people. So that means that there's a whole nother big group out there. So a wedge issue by design, a wedge divides, it splits. And so when you split voters, now remember that Joe Biden won the election, he won the presidency with 83 million votes. If mm -hmm. half of the people on based on that one issue say, John, I'm not with you because you're for reparations. Do I think reparations are required? Yes, I do. I absolutely do. Do I think they're owed? Yes, I do. I absolutely do. But the question is, how exactly? And you mentioned some people who are experts. I'm the first to admit, I'm not an expert on all of these things. Some people think, oh, you're running for president. You ought to know everything about this. No, nobody knows everything about these things. And there's multiple ways to attack a, an issue. Okay, so what I'm saying is I agree with everything you say in regards to is it necessary? Is it, is it deserved? Uh, should it be implemented? I agree with all of that. Yes, I do agree with that. The thing that I don't understand, and I'm I'm openly admitting it, and I want to have a conversation. I want to know what's the best way to do it, because if we're going to implement it, 
I don't want to throw money at a problem and not have it work. I want it to be effective. I'm worried about the effectiveness and the efficiency of it. I want to make it work. So there's other issues that go along with this. For instance, employment. I think it's insane that we have an economic system that on the one hand, you've got all of the social needs that we have, the infrastructure needs, and all that has to be built out, the energy needs, all of these things that have to be built out. On the other hand, you've got labor sitting idle, collecting unemployment. To me, that is a failure of an economic system. An economic system should tie labor together with needs. That's a fundamental. If you can't do that, it's a failure. So I would make the government the employer of last resort. So if there's someone in the community that doesn't have a good paying job to support his family, well then, and, and if, if industry can't accommodate and hire that person for a good wage, then I'll, the government will do it. We'll, we'll hire them ourselves because we've got plenty of work to do. We look at other nations like China, they've got, a, they've got an infrastructure that is a 21st century infrastructure. They have high speed rails that connect every major city, all the things we need, you know? And so, so there's so many facets to this and you are correct. It's a very complex issue. So um, now you say, well, I don't think we have to study it. I mean, I think that the idea that we need reparations and that they're deserved is absolutely correct. I just want to know how to do it in the best way. That's what I don't have a handle on. Does that make sense? That makes no. That, that makes total sense, and I'm, I'm just planting that seed in your head in a way because when we do have this presidential debate down the road that I'm going to host or whatever, because like I was telling you off air, there's I'm going to try to get eight to nine candidates, and hopefully you're a part of that as well, and we can have these discussions. And I'm telling you that everyone that I've interviewed have an opinion, and they have, I wouldn't call it a plan, but they have an idea of reparations that goes beyond a yes or a no. And it goes into economic policies and schooling policy differences and stuff like that. Th that would be my vision, I guess. When we talk about reparations, we have to look at it like that. Kind of like if you're using Richard Wolf for an example, and I know we follow him a lot. We, if you follow him a lot and we have these theories like MMT and stuff, it's no different than that. I mean. Is it to me, is just like building on an area that you maybe don't have as much exposure to because when it comes to economic policy, it seems like you have more or less a vision when it comes to that. But other areas, I mean, we can all improve on, you know, expanding those areas of knowledge and 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 come up with the actual plan of reparations. That's all I mean when I yeah. say that it is a very complex issue, but there still has to be some sort of a signal and and a couple of ideas leading up to that, even if it is a complex issue. Yeah, Kiko, I'd like to talk a little about my approach to problem solving. I worked in industry uh, most of my life, okay? So I started out in, automotive, uh, industry, in the automotive industry and in production. So I understand production. I was a production supervisor for Ford Motor Company. I transitioned, I got a degree in digital electronics. And I started working as a field engineer for Digital Equipment Corporation, repairing computers. I went from that to networks, and then I went to software and professional services. And I sold software and professional services to big multinational corporations and, and big national corporations for most of my working life, about 20 years. And so I really understand um, with professional services, the idea of process re-engineering. So if you have a company that's not getting the output that they expect, they're not getting market share, they're failing, however, what the, what the professional uh, business services do is they are designed to go in and, and, and re-examine the entire process and they do something called process re-engineering. They re-engineer the entire process, which means reorganizations within a company to make it more efficient, more effective to get the outcome that they expect. I would take the same approach to government. So when you, when, when we say, you know, having healthy, happy, productive human beings, which is what we want in our society, we want everybody to be at that level to maximize their potential, because then it's best for all of us to achieve that. We need to, from a governmental perspective, you got about 29, 30 million federal employees. I'd re-engineer the entire federal government around human health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So that would include the Department of Education, Department of Defense, you name it. Every single department in the federal government would be reorganized 
focused on the family and the health and well-being of our individuals, particularly our children, because if we do that in one generation, our children will be amazing. They're going to achieve their full potential and just imagine what that society would look like. You know, so, so you know, policing comes into that, social services comes into that, education comes into that, prison. Our prison system is, is the most ridiculous thing. It's privatized. The states are actually, I mean, think about a privatized prison system. How do you make more profit? You need more prisoners. Well, we don't want more prisoners. You got to, because that's a cost to our society. We want to rehabilitate. We don't want to punish. And we want to get those people who are currently in prison back engaged in our communities, working on behalf of all of us. These are good people who have maybe faced some tough conditions in their life. That's why they end up in prison, you know, mm -hmm. uh, poverty, all of those issues. But government should be in place to support society, support those people, eliminate those costs and make these people healthy, happy and productive so that we can all work together and, and, and achieve not just success and prosperity, but we want our, we want our people to thrive. We want them in creative endeavors. So we've got AI and we have automated uh, uh, technologies. We could we could do wonders with our transportation system, with our energy system. We got the technology to solve almost all of these problems. And where we don't, we're going to really invest in studying it. Uh, like uh, nuclear fusion is an example, which would be. I've, I've got an image. Oh, go ahead. Your your sound, Clark. I'm you're breaking up. Is, uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, the, uh, the the problem is, as though that technology replaces people's livelihood, there has to be a tax. There has to be a robot AI uh, automation tax, which, quite frankly, you know, generates revenue back into the system. Because what happens with with you know increased productivity and reducing costs and increasing profits, the way the system works now, you got the hoarders that get it all, you know, the top ten percent, and and they get everything. And 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 I think the latest statistic I saw is ninety five percent of Americans are competing for seven point four percent of the wealth. My gosh, <laughs> how can that be? That's how rigged the system is. Yeah, well, we're going to we, we need to rethink our entire uh, economic system. Uh, we have an ownership class that's very concentrated. And so just a very tiny group of people that could literally sit in my living room, control the interest of every major corporation. Um, what we need to do is spread that ownership. Uh, I like Richard Wolf's solution. It's one option, but I like his solution, which is let's make the employees the owners. Imagine every employee having a share in their corporation in which they work. Now they've got a vested interest in the, in the health and well-being of that, of that organization. And they're actually doing the work. If they were the owners and they had one share of stock and they had one vote, then they would elect their board. They would be establishing the policies and they would establish the pricing, all of those things. They wouldn't pollute their own communities. It wouldn't be like some, uh, some, some oligarch sitting in, a tower in New York, making a decision to close a factory in Cleveland or Detroit. Who's going to choose to outsource their own jobs to China or to Mexico? None of those things would happen if the workers themselves were doing. So Richard Wolf talks about that a lot. I really encourage everybody to listen to some of the things he has to say. And there are others. There's Michael Hudson. Uh, even even some of the oligarchs themselves recognize the the massive problems uh, brought about by our economic system. Uh, they don't necessarily come out and say, you know, do away with capitalism in a way that Why I would. would. That? <laughs> uh, but I mean, a guy like Ray Dalio recognizes the problem and knows that we have to, uh, I mean, in his mind, I'm sure he would rather adjust capitalism. In other, let's put some Band-Aids on it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we should re-engineer the entire thing. We could do much better, but we can talk about that a little later. You said something earlier. I mean, you guys had a mouthful there. Uh, you, you mentioned artificial intelligence, and I think episode three, we talked a little bit about artificial intelligence and the dangers, the possible danger of, um, you know, if that expands too much, you know, um, 
you, you do have a concern when you talk about the value of humans at that point. Um, would you even would you need the humans to a certain capacity if if AI was implemented in a certain type of way? I don't know. Uh, we're definitely moving in the AI direction. Like that's inevitable. I think we see that happening um, with automated vehicles and everything else. But the question I have for you is earlier you mentioned uniting all these people together. And that's the question, I, that's the biggest concern I have for an independent candidate like yourself, who, because if you're going away from the whole progressive banner, I completely understand that you don't want to be pigeonholed as being like a, another version of Bernie Sanders, for instance, because people will connect those dots. I believe that there are lots of issues to where you can connect lots of different types of people across political lines. My question for you would be, what would be three policies that John Stasevich has um, on his site that you think would unite communists and MAGA people and libertarians and all different types of people, regardless of their social class? What are three of those issues that come to mind when you think of that? Well, I, I think one issue is certainly getting the money, the special interest money out of the political system. I think across the spectrum, everybody agrees that uh, that's corruption. It's legalized and it's a problem. It doesn't serve our people. The next, uh, the next issue I think that almost everybody agrees on is they want their kids to have a good education. They want them to have health care. They want all of their basic needs met um, so that they can you know, achieve success in life. Uh, there's nobody in the political spectrum who says, I don't want my kids to have decent health care. Uh, and they do recognize that it isn't just their kids. Everybody's kids need these things. All of the people need that to be healthy and productive. I would say we need comprehensive health care, which would include uh, mental health care, dental health care. You know, wealthy people, mental health care is just like getting a physical exam. When they have a big um, trauma in their life, death in the family, major illness, they also get counseling so they can deal with it effectively, right? So dental care, if you don't get good dental care, you could have issues with cardiovascular in your heart. So all of these things are connected. So we need comprehensive health care. Everybody agrees on that. And, uh, and then in terms of the technology, that's a really interesting issue. You're right, the genie's out of the bottle. It's not going back. We've always had advances in technology. The problem is who controls it, who owns it, Okay. Um, right now, what the, the, the thing that makes technology like AI, which is, which is going to take the rate of change to a stratospheric exponential level, and the change is going to be so rapid, people are going to have a hard time adjusting to the rapid pace of change. The good news is that automation in the form of robots and AIs are gonna be able to do all of the labor and the manual stuff that people have always struggled with. And it's gonna free us up to be creative and have a quality life, okay? So that's the good side of AI. But then again, what you need is to make sure that it's controlled by us, the people. It's not uh, you know, concentrated in the hands of uh, a few individuals because then it could be used nefariously against us. So the, it comes back to that same issue about you know ownership. Uh, when you own it, you're vested. And you're consistent with that. Um, I give you that on the consistency because you basically made the case that these mega companies should be split up. I mean, it kind of goes into that whole idea because I mean, look at the tech companies and the relationship with that and the information of what you can say on their platforms. And so you don't, the people don't have any say if the tech company can decide what that person can say or not. It goes into free speech. It goes into control, basically, is what you're saying. So no, I agree with you on that. Um, but it there's a lot, there's so much that has to happen. And I think you admit that changing this system is going to take a lot of time, unfortunately. It's going to take time to change. Um, and just Well, I'm not saying that. that. I'm not saying that. You're not saying that? No, I'm not saying that. I, I think, uh, well, you know, I've uh, I've been studying human psychology my entire life. I understand human development, cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, and behavioral psychology. I look to people like uh, Robert uh, Sapolsky and uh, um, Gabor Mate. There, mm -hmm. So we, we have a really good understanding. Um, and when you do have that kind of understanding, 
you can learn one of the things that's challenging for people is dealing with change. But there are healthy ways to deal with change and you can change quite rapidly. It's a matter of conditioning people differently. So I can adapt to change very quickly. I mean, I went from, you know, I, I actually started out in industry and then I went to uh, digital computer sciences and software and, and I transitioned from an engineering role into sales and marketing roles. And then I went in the end of my career into nursing and worked for nine years at University of Michigan Hospital as a registered nurse on their neurology unit where we had seizure patients and we had a comprehensive stroke unit. So I've learned to adapt and adapt quickly. And, and so we have the potential to do that. You think it doesn't you, I'm not saying that people necessarily themselves, I'm talking about this system that we live under that, that you've pointed out uh, eloquently and correctly has significant deficiencies to it. Um, I'm not talking about the people themselves necessarily, but we as people have had to live within this system and the system hasn't changed. I, I'm not talking about the people changing. I'm talking about the system changing. Right. Now, what mechanism, what what would be one of your initial contributions, you think, to pushing that ball more to where we do have significant changes in the system outside of the ballot access stuff? Because I know I, I, I commend you for that. The ballot access stuff is that's a grassroots bottom up that has to be taken into consideration before we can even change the electoral system. But I guess outside of the electoral system, what would be one of the biggest immediate changes that you see in your campaign that could contribute to something that advances society? Well, I, I think it starts with electoral politics. It's also, uh, but there's also local initiatives, okay? At a local level, we see people, you know, transforming, helping one another. So um, it's not an either or, but essentially what has to happen is the, the ownership class. It's a small group of people, the World Economic Forum. They're very well organized. They're very well funded. And so when you, when you view this from the perspective of a class war, then you realize the first, the, the, the first casualty of war is always the truth. So when we look at the media, we don't know what the truth is. We don't, there's a corporate media that's dominant and they're the ones that control all the messaging. Now, how many people believe that what they hear in the corporate media is the truth, right? So that's a casualty of a class war. It's a casualty of every war, the truth, the propaganda starts. And the first rule of war is divide and conquer. And we know they're very effective at that. Look at our society. Every presidential election, either the Republicans win by a tiny margin or the Democrats win by a tiny. The, the society is largely divided and they're divided and they're angry and they're blaming each other. Mm. It, despite the fact that we all have children and common interests, we're all concerned about the environment and their future. We're concerned about their health. We've got all these common interests and yet we are completely divided. That is what I'm trying to change. So, but it starts with the, so, so the ballot access coalition is one of the tools, one of the pieces of organizing. So the working class itself has to be organized. John Stasevich as president's not going to make, uh, you know, I'm not going to make the changes. I'm going to derive my power from the people. If they put me in the white house, for the first time in human history, they will have a representative who represents them, not owned by somebody else, right? It has to start there at the top. And then with the Ballot Access Coalition, we're going to go all the way through the government, all the way down to the local level. And we're going to change the culture. People are going to, instead of blaming one another, they're going to start working together. So when I have the megaphone of the White House, that's the kind of message. We're changing culture itself but not me. I'm one person. There's going to be a lot of people like me that are in my campaign that are going to be paying a part in this change. And all of the people out there who are now struggling in two and three jobs, which is insane, <laughs> you know, in, in a society where we got the automation, where literally we could get more done if everybody only worked three days a week. That would all be that all that's required. Think about all the time we would be able to spend with our children and enjoying life. 
thriving, mm -hmm. you know? So that's the vision for the future. That's what we want. But it, but, but um, you have to start somewhere. And so that's the whole purpose of my campaign. And again, if, if, if I'm unsuccessful, there's going to be somebody that follows behind me because this ballot access coalition, it's going to continue on. It's going to be disconnected from my campaign. It could become a nonprofit. It could provide services like Clark has provided for my campaign and like Jason has provided. These people can help other people. And this organization is going to grow organically. Once the working class is organized, the game is over. The game is over. Right now, it's a rigged system. And job one is getting the money out to unrig it and organizing the working class. It's always been that way throughout human history. But because of the digital technology we have and the ability to communicate the way we are right now and to get out. But it's up to every working class person out there to stop blaming their neighbors and go and connect with them in ways that they have to understand that their needs are exactly the same as their family's needs. So we have to stop the blame game. Don't fall into that trap. But that's what happens in a class war. They, they, the first rule of war, any war, including class war, is divide and conquer. And we know the oligarchy and the World Economic Forum have been very good at doing that. So we have to avoid it. Clark, I, I want to bring you in and, well, I'll call you CJ because John calls yeah. everyone different names. He calls me by my real name. <laughs> but other people do too. I'm not going to bring those people up. But um, CJ, I had a question. Do you have a comment about any of what we're saying here? And do you have a question for John yourself? Well, you know, obviously John and I have spent a lot of time together. and. Um, I, I tend to boil things down um, to it doesn't take any words to speak the truth. And, and the truth that we're dealing with right now is there's been so much consolidation of wealth and power for the few at the expense of the many that the main solution that, that we need to present somehow, uh, and, and it always comes back to this, is we need broad distribution, wealth, power and authority. John touched on some of the things, you know, employee owned companies referred to as ESOPs. And one that's near and dear to my heart is the American co-op. You know, there used to be a time in this country where all the neighbors would get together and if somebody's barn burned, the next damn weekend you'd have the entire community there rebuilding their barn. You know, what happened to that? Um, it's it's you know, from little kids, we're raised to be competitive. You know, there's just winners and losers. No, that's the wrong message. You know, the more we share, the more we have. And you can call me a communist for that, or whatever, <laughs> or socialist or whatever. But it's true, you know. They, they actually do a pretty good job of that with in kindergarten. You know, learn to share. You know, this is the class resources. Everybody has access to them. Anybody can use them, but you have to have respect for your for your fellow classmates and community and whatever that you know you have to share. You'll get your turn, you know, if it's something that that's you know confined or restricted, and and you know everybody doesn't get a copy. Um, and it's so basic. So I think you know with with attacking the money and politics. Again, that's the consolidation of, of wealth and power. Uh, and um, I'm very encouraged. I forget the uh, the congressman's name, but he's introduced legislation to get the congressional representation up to like, I think 556, because we've been frozen at 405 representatives for almost a hundred years. Um, it's, it's, it gets complicated. It's associated with the, with the census and, and uh, allocations and appropriations. In fact, I think it was called the Appropriations Act. But we really, you know, we really need better representation with a different ratio. And this gets into a new concept of getting away from boundaries, political boundaries, which are, you know, fictitious human constructs, you know, and that's how they gerrymander the system and rig it. You know, if we had population 
proportional representation. Now, for example, Oregon is talking about, you know, those conservative counties join Idaho because they're conservative, you know, and the left coast of Oregon, you know, I don't need to probably go into much more <laughs> explanation of that. You know, if with more congressional representative, that could essentially be done. The states could maintain their boundaries. And it, it's like um, student teacher ratio. I, I don't think there's anybody out there that would dispute that the lower the student <clears throat> ratio to the teacher, the better. You know, well, wouldn't representation work the same way? I've, I've proposed, you know, going back to the original traditional breakdown of population proportional representation which was a 30,000 constituents to one representative. In that scenario, and maybe I'm deploying collective bargaining, <laughs> with our current population of eligible voters in the United States, we should have over 7,500 congressional representatives. But nobody talks about this, you know, because that's, oh, we'd lose control. You're damn right you'd lose control, but the people would gain control. And it, that would blend in to, and support the decentralization and get away from this consolidation of wealth and power. Uh, how, could, uh, how could any special interest or, or lobby, uh, lobbyist organization or whatever um, cover the, the, what is it, 15 times, 15 time increase in expense to buy the government? <laughs> I think even our trillionaires would be uh, would be challenged with that, and and I would love to put forth that presence or that that challenge. And that's one of the reasons I'm working with John's campaign um, because he's he listens to me. You know, I'm here because I have an opportunity because of my association with John to speak about some of the things that are near and dear to my heart that I think I've got figured out. Anyway. Thank you, John. I love you. <laughs> that's something that's something that I have the same thought. Actually, what you said, CJ, makes me it triggers the thought even more because I had the question, not really a question, but John, but a comment about okay, maybe it's a response to what he said earlier about I think that there's a misconception that people aren't united. I want to debunk that that's going on because. I think that there are people talking across class lines and racial lines. I know it's happening because that's a point of this forum. And the people that I talk to, and I know a lot of Trump people, and they agree with me on a lot of stuff. I know a lot of Biden people agree with me on a lot of stuff. It's not even about agreeing with different types of people. It's um, what most people don't have trust of is the government. And I think what you just said scares people. Like they don't even trust the Congress now, so why would they want more people that are crooks in the government representing them when they don't even feel that the 400 and however 35 people that's supposed to be representing them in the House aren't representing them, and then you add these 100 senators on, which I don't even see the purpose of senator, the Senate at this point, when you pass a bill and then these people get 60% to, to more or less determine if it passes or not. And you just have more checks and balances on top of what the house is supposed to be representing the people, but then you have to go through another filter and then nothing gets passed, nothing gets action, no action happens. And I, I just think people have a distrust of politicians in general. And that's been a very consistent sentiment that I've heard from the left, the right, the center, up, down, it doesn't matter. And it's becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, and it's not even a fringe element at this point. There's centrist people that I know that are pretty much saying, how can we trust these politicians anymore because of all the money that's in? Then that, regardless of it been 7,000 people or 435, how do we, if the money is in there, how does that help the people? Let me, let me uh, kind of elaborate on that. Um, you know, every, every storm cloud has a silver lining or so they say. One of the things that we learned from the pandemic was that uh, work from home is a great concept and, and, it, and it's effective and, and you can perform just as well, you know, in your home office as you can in a, in a, in a corporate office, lack of better choice of words, whatever. Uh, but, the, but the thing is that we have to remember is what if those, what if, and we, I'm going to use my collective bargaining example of 30,000 to one uh, ratio. Look at every community that has 30,000 people and they have a home officing representative who can use, oh my gosh, technology, communication, automation, 
even AI to do the work, you know, rather than flying back and forth every weekend, destroying our planet, you know, with, with CO2 and jet fuel and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, there, and you know what? The original Congress, like a lot of our state legislatures, it was a part-time job. I'm not proposing that it becomes a part-time job. It would still be a full-time job, but you know, come on, the the Cadillac healthcare, the pension, you know, throw that out. That makes it affordable. You know, it, a, a two-year, a two-year service looks great on your resume, and that's about all it should do, really. That's all it should be. You shouldn't get paid for life forever because you got elected once. There's something wrong with this system. You know, so again, it's it's it follows that concept of decentralization. How do you fix a, a problem where you've got centralized control and, and they they they've got a death grip on it? You decentralize, and it, it's not blood in the streets and and you know watering the tree of liberty with blood. It's simply building another system, like Buckmeister Fuller has said numerous times. You know, with with his great wisdom, it's like, don't fight the system, build a new one. And that's one of the reasons I'm with John. We're going to build a new system. It might take us a while, but we're not going to give up. John, do you have um, any response to what CJ said? Uh, because, because I do have some questions about something you brought up earlier about, um, I know you're very passionate about the wars, um, ending the wars and um, the police state. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what you have on your site about healthcare as well, but is there anything that you want to respond to what CJ was saying? Well, simply to say that, uh, see, this is, this is what we're promoting, open dialogue and discussion. Um, as I said, I don't have all the answers and, and CJ and I, um, you know, when we say, here's a, here's a potential solution. What I would like to see are national referendums. So I wanna have the open dialogue and discussion. We come up with option A, B, C, we lay out all the economics of it. We lay out the policies and how they would work, how the implementation would go, how we would transition, and then put it before the people, which one do you want? So they're well-informed and they make the decision which is the way we want it. I don't want to be the one making the decision and neither does Clark. We have our ideas. We wanna place it out there, but the process is more important. So I'm not going there to implement my plan. I've got some ideas. I want open engagement. The process is very important. Getting the money out and having a process that's inclusive that brings people in. So all of the different points of view, all of the perspectives, which are important to understand, are brought into the discussion so we can optimize our solutions. Mm -hmm. I, my question to that, I've, I've heard this like 10 times probably, and it's not a bad thing that I've heard it 10 times, but the question is who right now, and I may already have the answer to it, but I just wanna know from your mouth, who is keeping us from taking this money out of the politics? Like what, what would be the immediate route to get to that point to where we can just take it out like what does that require well there's multiple routes the route i would prefer is to amend the constitution okay. a constitutional amendment and so that would take congress right so i would challenge congress to um, only have publicly funded elections get all of the money out of the system make it illegal to bribe a public official so anybody in a corporation or a private interest group that that hands money to a politician, any politician that takes it, breaks the law, and they are going to have to, um, you know, they're going to have to face the consequences of that, whatever we decide those are. But essentially, we've got to, if we're going to own our system, we got to get the special money out. Everybody knows that money corrupts. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. If a guy can come with enough money, he can get you to do his bidding, right? Um, and we do it ourselves anyway. We go into a corporation, we start working for a corporation, we're cogs in a wheel. We don't set policy, we don't set prices of the products, we don't do any of that. Other people do that, uh, the owners, okay? But once the policy's set, we know, we do it, we follow it, or we get spun out, right? Um, 
So, um, you know, changing the economics, we'll get into more later, but the process is important. Um, did, I don't know if I answered your question or not. I think no, I might've. No, you did. No, no, that's fine. Um, no, you answered my question. I just, um, a lot of what we're saying, it does it goes back to something to where this money, money has been spent constantly. And so when you do take stances, like um, when you say ending the perpetual wars, that's bringing money, ideally, or saving money for our economy. Like that, that, and it's not even just the economic thing. We know that that all, pretty much all issues have consequences. It's not just healthcare, even not. It's not just about your health. It's about the environment and everything. It's not just one particular issue. But let's just take the wars, for instance, and saving all that money that we're funding in other countries. And just all the lives that have been lost on top of that, like that's completely lost in this conversation. It's just the millions of people who have died um, over all these endless conflicts and it, nothing ever seems to change. Um, but what does change is that the transnational corporations just grasp more control of those regions. I mean, we see the connections, we see why the war machine continues, but there's no effort to end the wars from, from anyone, it seems like. Um, what will let, be, let, let, yeah, what let, let me address just, in that direction. Okay, yeah, let me let me address just that. Uh, well, first of all, on getting the money, I'll uh, go back. And let me finish up on that last answer because I, I I realized what I left out. Uh, so I can't get Congress to change the uh, amend the Constitution, but the 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 public, if they were to put me in the White House, there'd be that public pressure. So any congressman that refuses to get the money out, we would go right down into his district. And we would organize that district and we would remove him from office and we'd put somebody in there that does want to get the money out. So it wouldn't be me demanding Congress do it because I don't have the power, but the people have the power. So if I'm representing the people and I can help organize them in those districts, we'll get rid of those corrupt guys that are in there just for the money. So I'm going back to that. In regards to the perpetual wars for profit, you have to understand when I say uh, a process of going down to the root cause of the problem. It's not possible with our economic system to end those wars because the economic system, a military industrial contractor needs to diminish his inventory in order to produce more and to employ the people who do the producing. So if we don't blow those weapons up, if we don't destroy those tanks, if we don't destroy those ships and those helicopters, people are out of work. So in our economic system, there's no choice. You have to go to war, you see. So that's going to the root cause. Yes, there's all the moral issues. We all agree on that. It's insane for us to destroy one another's lives and to engage in war at a moral level. But when the economics drives it, the economics become the most important factor because people need to survive. You need your job, so they have to blow up the bombs so that you can continue to work. That's the way our economy is structured. So when, if you look at every single problem in a for-profit system, problems are profit centers. When you have a problem, somebody can make a profit solving the problem. That's the economic system that works. So healthcare is privatized, prisons are privatized. They want to privatize the education system. Every single problem, they want to make a profit center. And of course, concentrate the wealth because the way our capitalist system works is wealth gets concentrated because it's a winner take all. So in the formula, you know, success in a capitalist system means profit. Profit equals whatever it takes. There's no consideration for the human health and well-being, no consideration for morality and ending wars, no consideration for the health and well-being of our children and our families. It's left out of the equation. We need an economic system that puts all of that into the equation, that those are considerations. So these decisions are complex, but Again, going to the root of the problem is the key to solving it. Will you, so what's your view on the military? Is there a purpose for the military? I mean, I know you, I mean, 
you're making it more of an economic angle. Um, but at the end of the day, just like for instance, we know that there have been anti-war rallies like all year long they've been happening. And there's one organized, you know, for the upcoming month um, in DC, there've been a lot of anti-war rallies lately with different factions. But would you increase the military budget, for instance? Like what, what is your view on that kind of stuff? So, so if you're in office and you're commander in chief, what would you do to get these military bases away? Like, like what would you do? Guantanamo Bay is still operating. Like those types of things, like I understand that there's a profit to keep the wars going on, but you seem to agree, agree that there's no purpose of having them at the same time too, because you talk a lot about collaboration on your site. You talk about communicating with the world more, like we need to work with the rest of the world. And I, I agree with that sentiment. So so what what would you do as president when it comes to that? Well, immediately, like Ukraine, I'd stop funding it uh, for the current one, right? I would also, <clears throat> you know, our military budget, so we've got all of these soldiers, and instead of improving the, you know, society, building the infrastructure, they're destroying societies. So we're paying them to destroy things. And then a handful of people, corporations go in later, and they buy up the ruins, and they rebuild it, and they make profit off that. So the war is a profit center. So what I would do as president and commander in chief is all of our troops would come home and we would build our infrastructure. We'd have mass transit. We'd have a transportation system that would be designed. Like for instance, I own uh, a truck that I need to do some things and I own a car. So I've got all these vehicles, but the fact of the matter is it's the most inefficient system. These vehicles sit there 99% of the time and I may only use it occasionally. And when I do, it's useful, I've got it. But boy, I would much rather pick up my phone, click, click, click. And the right vehicle shows up at my door just exactly when I need it, takes me where, now that could be a public utility. So imagine that I don't have to worry about oil changes, I don't have to worry about engine tune-ups. All I do is go on my phone, grab. Now, now when it's a public utility, these vehicles could be autonomous even. They could just show up where they needed, when they're needed, and they're working all the time. That's, that's efficiency. So think about what that means for our environment. Mm -hmm. When you're using the vehicle's efficiency, you don't need efficiently, you don't need as many. So this, I get picked up at my door, to move me and my materials that I need to move from point A to point B. And maybe that point B is a, you know, a, some sort of a, a subway system that takes me now to the downtown area where I want to go. Or maybe it's a high-speed rail that takes me to Los Angeles in a couple of hours, right? But all this system is a very efficient system. We would save literally trillions of dollars. If you look at healthcare, Currently, our privatized health care system, we spend twice as much as the next highest spending nation in the world. So we spend $6,000 more per capita than, let's say, France or Germany or the Netherlands, who have much better outcomes. We get the worst outcomes in the industrialized world and pay twice as much. What that means in numbers is this. We, let's, we got 332 million people, according to the last census. Let's just round it to 300 million. 300 million people times $6,000 times 10 years. That's a savings of $18 trillion. Our national debt's approaching 32, 33. I'm not sure exactly. It keeps, it's going up so quickly. Who could keep track of it anymore? But think about $18 trillion. What could we do with that if we invested that in our families and in our communities? That's just, that's just healthcare. Military, we know what our budget is there, 850 or so billion dollars annually. So that's what, eight point, uh, in 10 years, um, I don't know how many trillions. Think about the savings there. We take those people, bring them back home, put them to work building our infrastructure. We now have an efficient infrastructure. We're not destroying the world. Other, other societies are going to copy us. We have to get to the point where we recognize we don't just have to do what's good for the American people. We need to spread it to the world. We need to help other people around the world who are struggling. We can't be divided fighting each other. We, 
it's gotten to the point with transportation the way it is, the planet has gotten much smaller. We don't need all these in uh, these artificial divisions that we currently have. So they've got the same needs we do and we should support them and then they'll support us. So we can transform not just our nation, but the world. Of course, you start by cleaning your own doorstep. You want to change the world, sweep your own porch, as the saying goes. So we're going to clean up right here at home. Other people are going to follow us. They're going to see what we're doing, and they're going to want to be a part of that. And those leaders aren't going to have any choice because those people are going to demand it. Right? I, I don't, I, I don't. I, I think that's for, I think that's a good message, but maybe that's a John Sassman's message because I, I've traveled all over the world and I, I think that other countries do their own thing and that's the way it should be. I don't think yeah. people are modeling the United States of America. I think other countries are totally fine with their own autonomy and they, they think that their model is the best model too. I mean, I think, I think that we could probably learn from more other countries than other way around instead of us influencing. I think that we could probably learn more from other countries and we would be a better country instead of us trying to set an example we already have prosperous examples that we don't choose to follow because we have our own corporate interest I, but i think that's part of the problem is that we're so tied into the world economy that we it's hard for us to set a positive example because we're so into everyone else's business and i think that that's i think it's really hard to um I mean, are you really setting a positive example? I think people just want people to leave them alone. I, I, I guess that's what I'm kind of getting at. But um, Well, no, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. I, I'm not saying that we, you know, when I say we set a positive example, who doesn't want to do that? I mean, we, you know, right, we, right. We, could, we, could, we could look to the rest of the world. I'm not saying we force anyone to do anything. I'm just saying that when they look at the quality of our life and they look at what we're doing, we're going to be, you know, we could create the example that others want to follow. Uh, it, when it comes to, uh, you know, a mass transit system, uh, uh, a national mass transit system, you know, we created the national highway system. Eisenhower did that. And look what it did for commerce. It transformed our nation. It put us on top of the world. We had the best transportation system in the world at the time. Now, we've fallen far behind since then. But imagine if we had a 21st century transportation system similar to what I described. I'm not forcing people to get rid of their cars. You want to keep your car? Go ahead and keep it. But you know what's going to happen? The transportation, uh, our transportation system will be so convenient, so easy to use. It'll make so much sense that they're going to want to get rid of their cars. They might keep them just for, you know, antiques or whatever, uh, maybe to drive on Sunday. But over time, uh, maybe over a generation or two, people aren't going to want to own cars. They're going to go, why would I do that? Why would I want to spend more money when I can have this efficient system uh, meet my needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not just saying that uh, we're going to go and, and tell anybody what to do. We're not in a position, and, and I don't believe in that either. Um, but I believe that we have uh, influence, and our influence is, uh, you know, our example. So we set up our society the way we want. Other people will look at us. They may make different decisions. They may find a better way. We may end up copying them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, corporations do it. They, they'll go and, let's say, if uh, Mercedes builds a better vehicle, you can bet that General Motors grabs that vehicle, has their engineers tear it down, reverse engineer it. And how come they're getting market share and we're not, you know? So they copy one another because they want to be more efficient. They want to be more successful, obviously. And, and nations will do that. I like different cultures. I think different cultures are, uh, I look at it as a positive. Our diversity is actually our strength because for one thing, you, you get a different perspective on the world, right? We physically can't be in the same place at the same time. So you and I, even sitting where we're at, we see the world differently because physically we can't have the same view. So you're looking at one side of the screen. I'm looking, you know, um, so diversity is good because it brings in more ideas, you know, and then we can now have a rational discussion and we can talk and collaborate. We want to cooperate, collaborate, and work together. That's the key to success in every endeavor, no matter what it is, whether it's the political system or a business, a family. It's better when you collaborate and work together. Uh, so when you have that kind of structure, that kind of framework, that kind of mindset, and that kind of culture, that's what's going to drive, uh, you know, if you want to call it progress. Mm -hmm. um, but no, we don't want to, we're, we're not, we're, just the opposite of forcing people, you know, is what I'm proposing. 
And in fact, uh, I think I've mentioned to you, I was a conscientious objector. Wow, if everybody were a conscientious objector, refused to pick up guns to shoot other people, we wouldn't have any wars. I mean, every individual could make that choice. I made it, right? I, uh, you know, but that's a personal choice. Some people, you know, may decide that, uh, you know, they want to play a role in defense. But I think ultimately the world has to come together to survive. And I think that we're going to have international laws that uh, kind of override um, local and national. You can do things, but there's some certain human rights that we all have to agree on. And that has to be global. And wars are one of them. We should agree not to destroy each other's nations. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, there's so much more I want to talk about that, but I'm not because um, <laughs> I just won't. It would take up all the discussion. But I want to bring CJ in because I want to segue into um, the whole idea of um, policing. I like the way you explain the military. Like, I guess if we're to pull out of all these countries and all these different interests, um, you would basically transition the military to, okay, that same corpus that we call the military would be helping us out with infrastructure projects, environmental issues and stuff, as opposed to destroying other countries and, and other properties. That's what you're saying. I say it's a possibility. That's one option. Okay. Okay. So as far as policing is concerned, I know I've asked you like the first episode and I kind of got an idea of what you felt about policing. Um, I kind of get the impression that you see the purpose of police, but maybe the function would be different in the way policing is set up now. Um, are you for ending qualified immunity is a direct question I have for you. Uh, this is a question I've asked to every person that's running for president right now. Are you for ending qualified immunity, which would basically inhibit this sort of incentive to have this bad behavior? when it comes to abusing the citizens? Well, I'm for responsibility. So as a nurse, you know, um, uh, we're human, we make mistakes. And I could uh, potentially as a nurse have made a mistake that might cost somebody uh, their health. You know, it's a, there's that potential to make a human mistake. Uh, so I think intent is very important when you start looking at uh, things like immunity. I, I think that we have to, when there's, uh, when, when there's harm that happens, I think it has to be investigated. So as an example, at U of M, if uh, I made, I remember early in my career, I made an error, a drug error, and I gave the wrong drug to a wrong person, okay? We had a policy of self-report. So immediately when I realized I, I, made, I made a mistake, I went right to my boss. Now, part of the deal was that when I self-report, they're not going to, you know, uh, what what the what U of M Hospital was interested in is seeing across the spectrum how many people are making the same mistake, and then they would change the system. So they weren't interested in punishing the individuals that made mistakes, um, which are normal human mistakes. We we all try our best. Obviously, if it were something I intended to do, then they would definitely want to punish me or get rid of me. But, but what they did want us to do is self-report so they could see if it was a systemic issue. Was it happening all over the hospital? And then they could change policy and try to correct it, okay? I think that policing could be similar to the, you know, I think that there might be certain risk uh, in, associated with that profession. And I don't think people are going to be perfect. They're going to make mistakes. Uh, I think uh, when those mistakes are made, we want to hold people accountable and responsible. But if their intention was... Uh, right. I think that's an important factor. Um, and I, but, but then I, you know, you're, you're supposed to follow policy. People make mistakes and, and there's always consequences that go with mistakes. So for instance, if my mistake was a big enough mistake, it cost somebody their life as an example, it would have been appropriate for them to say, you know, I don't think nursing is a job that you ought to have. You seem to be prone to taking people's lives. Right. And, and, and for, and then, and then I should be moved into maybe a profession, retrain, go into something so I can make a living that I'm better suited for. So it's possible that you have a, a guy in policing or in nursing or in some other, a doctor 
they're well-intentioned, but maybe that's just not the profession for them. They're not suited for it. Maybe they move on and we transition them to something else where they can be beneficial to society. So that could be a form of holding them accountable and responsible, removing them from that situation where they might in the future do it. These are the kinds of things we have to talk about. And this is the, so having a real good understanding of human development and human psychology, going to the professionals that understand how people operate and how we work, that can be very informative in setting policy. So I always want to go to the science and the experts. I want to follow the evidence where it takes us. And we want to try to do the right things, the rational things. And we want to try to do it in a fair and democratic way. I don't want just a handful of people making major decisions. I think if there are decisions that impact our people's lives, that they should have a voice. So that's the key to everything. You can't be responsible if you're not making the decision or don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. I, so as a nurse, as a nurse, I had a voice. I had a voice in the system. I could go to my boss. I could talk about circumstances. I could report it. They kept a database. And then I could help them adjust the system and make it better. And maybe that even means moving me out of my position into something else. As a society, we could do that. Yeah, but we're not nurses don't have guns and they don't have weapons on them protecting supposedly protecting people. We're talking about uh, an arm of the government, which I mean, I've elaborated this several times on the forum. You have the intelligence agencies, the military and the police. And my personal opinion, those people, we're at the mercy of those people because those people can and will execute you if they see fit, you know, given the situation. And we've seen several, I don't need to get into the history of public executions that people have seen in front of our eyes. Um, when it comes to police. And um, this is something that the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, Socialist Parties, across political spectrums agree the end in qualified immunity is the right thing to do. The two major parties don't want to end qualified immunity. And that's why I asked you that question, because to me, that is a significant, that would alter the behavior of those people who are in control, patrolling neighborhoods and, you know, doing whatever they want to do now. I just think it gives police a lot of protection that the police unions are, are amongst the strongest in the country um, because they have protections, but the everyday citizens don't have those types of protections. And that's why I asked that question. You seem to be limiting immunity, but not necessarily. You seem to have implied as case by case and not just in and qualified immunity for police, if I hear you correctly. Well, I think what I'm saying is that. Um... Uh, I'm saying that the, it's, again, uh, you know, if, if you're asking for a yes or no answer to a complex question, uh, this is a really complex question. And I think it deserves to really look deeply into the to question. So let's imagine that we do have, let's say I say, okay, we're going to end immunity for the police. You say that that would set an example. We know that the death penalty, one of the reasons that people are against the death penalty is because it really doesn't set the example. You kill somebody and, and put them to death, it doesn't lower the number of people that go and kill, they still do it. They still do it because there's so many factors that go into you know, murder, right? Um, so you know, again, it's a complex question because when people have all of their basic needs met, when they're children, we don't let any child fail. We make sure their basic needs are fed. We make sure those families are taken care of. We make sure they have enough money to support themselves. All of those things play into, you know, uh, crime, right? And so, again, we're going to the root cause. So, you know, I think it's an assumption to say that if we end immunity, we're going to have a better outcome. That may be true. But then again, it may not be true. I wouldn't say that it that what you your thought there is absolutely correct. It might not be. Um, I would be willing to discuss it and and uh, you know and bring the experts in, evaluate it. That may be a part of it. But I like again, I, I explained a model. Um, you know, I use drugs as a nurse that were as lethal as a gun, and so I did have powers over people's lives. I could have very easily killed people with the drugs that I administered. Mm -hmm. And so there, so, you know, and, and I'm not saying that that's the answer. I'm saying 
we we need deeper discussions on these things. Um, so we have a society that's under stress. There's a lot of stressors for all of us. There are economic stresses, there are social stresses, um, there are stresses related to stage of life. You know, uh, teenagers, they want to be included, they want to be accepted. There's all these things. And so um, to, to try to put band-aids on things, hoping that it's the right answer, you may find that you do it and it doesn't change the outcome. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're kind of chasing your tail, right? We need to take a more, uh, a more practical approach, a more scientific approach to these problems. And see, this is the problem with debating as opposed to discussing. Now you say, well, we want to have a debate with all the candidates. I think those should be framed as discussions because if there's another candidate that has a better idea than I do, I want to learn about it. I'm more than happy. I'm not concerned with winning an argument or being right. Or I don't care who's right and who's wrong. I care what's right and what's wrong. I want to know what the truth is. So, you know, I don't, uh, when it comes to other candidates that I would compete against, I want to have a discussion like we're having. Let's go back and forth. Let's explore it. Let's figure out what the best path is. I certainly am not sitting here claiming to know all the answers and all the best paths for all these things, but I'm not going to take the shortcut, the easy way, the political expedient way of checking all the boxes and saying, yes, 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 because I think I'm going to win an election. It's not me winning an election is not the important thing. Moving humanity in the right direction. That's what this is about. It's about a movement. It's about, I'm just one person. I'm not doing this for John Stasevich. As a matter of fact, this is complicating my personal life. I could be retired, enjoying my kids and grandkids. And here I am involved in a massive national campaign, right? So this is not for me and it's not about me. This is about us. It truly is. I'm going into public service because I want to be a public servant. I don't want to profit. I'm not looking for fame and I'm not looking for prestige. I'm already happy with my life. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I frame things differently. Now in our culture, they're not used to that. What they want to do is they want to, they have all the check boxes and here's this candidate, A, A B, C. Okay. I'm checking five boxes for him, six for him, eight for him. We're going to vote based on that. But although we know that our votes don't really count because we don't have the information to even know whether the system, the voting system is, has integrity, right? Uh, people are questioning the very system that elect people. I totally, I, I agree. I totally, I, I agree with that. But I, I want to ask CJ as, as the director of marketing for John's campaign, do you feel like that that runs the risk for a lot of people when because people do want yes and no answers. I know you keep saying that, but people want yes and no answers. And for me, qualified immunity is a pretty cut and dry thing. I mean, it's like you either for it or you're against it. I, I don't I don't see the issue with that. And I think that's what people want because they're scared in a way because they feel like people are kind of taking them this way. But then it's like they get dropped off somewhere else. I, I can see the fear of the voters just w when those kind of questions come up like legalization of cannabis, yes or no. I don't think people are looking for in-between answers necessarily. They want like a yes or a no. Like, well, I'll tell you one thing. Yes or uh, no. Yeah, Kiko, I could tell you one thing that would be a yes or no, real quick answer. D. Miller tries the police. Definitely mm -hmm. a yes. Let's get rid of all the massive weapons. But then again, at the same time that you do that, you have to um, do the other things to you know, so that our people are healthy. You, you don't, now I don't, we, we, we have to talk about what a legitimate policing function is. Um, certainly you probably, when you're younger, maybe you went into a bar, two guys had too much to drink. Next thing you know, there's violence in the bar. Mm -hmm. Who's going to stop the violence? Who's going to stop it? Is that a legitimate policing function? Mm -hmm. And if that's true, now, what if those guys have weapons? Uh, how does, so you could understand somebody that says, you know, I'm willing to help my community. I want to work with my community. I don't want drunk guys in a bar shooting each other and maybe innocent people that are sitting there, uh, in the crowd. Right. 
Um, how would you solve that problem? So, so, you know, to pretend that we've got all the answers, I think is a big mistake because I think more often than not, we've seen where our politicians say, I know what the answer is and they go and they implement it and we find out it didn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just because it's politically expedient or because people expect it, maybe we need to change the way people think about things. Maybe they have to realize that, you know, it's better that we all engage and we come up with the solutions together. Don't just depend on, there's no white height, uh, uh, white knight that's going to, you know, come in on his white stallion and save the day. John Stasovich isn't going to do it. Bernie Sanders is not going to do it. Donald Trump is not going to be that white knight. Joe Biden isn't. There is no white knight. You want justice. We all have to stand for justice. We have to agree on some certain basic premises and, you know, human health and well-being. It's not a secret. I, we know. We have the technology. We know how to help our children to be healthy, happy, and productive. That's not a secret. We know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the political will. So if you want to change the world, you know, you start by changing yourself. If you want to change the world, you start by cleaning your own doorstep. These are the kinds of, that's what leadership does. Leadership, which is what I would be if I were a president, I would lead to people into thinking about changing the culture, to change themselves, to help their neighbors. All of those things coming together, that's going to be the way it happens, okay? Because I'm more interested in results than I am winning an election. Now, I know that that may sound to some like a cop-out. It's no cop-out at all. In fact, it's the only thing that's actually going to work. And I'd be willing to discuss if somebody tells me I've got the solution, I know this is going to work, and it's defund the police. I'll say, what does that mean exactly? And they tell me, we try it. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. I don't know. I'd be willing to give it a shot. I'd say if it's a step in the right direction and it's the expedient thing to do, I might say, yeah, let's do it. Because I, right now, the other plan is going to take longer, and that takes us one step in the right direction. Let's try it, see what happens. If it doesn't work, we can always undo it and go back, right? But the important part is the process and getting people engaged. But but I guess I guess I want to I want to get CJ's perspective on this since he's on your marketing team. Yeah, like, yeah. Do you feel that this runs the risk um, with John when it comes to because you're going to get these questions constantly, not just on my forum. You're going to go on bigger platforms and they're going to ask you questions and. I wouldn't even say that the questions I've asked today have been gotcha questions. I just think that they're questions um, where people expect a certain level of expediency. Because if you use the premise that people are being, um, I guess, they're suffocating right now, they're marginalized and everything else. If we agree on that premise, then you would have to understand that people are looking for urgency out of their politicians. They don't have time to wait for 30, 40 minutes of incrementalism or, or 40 years of incrementalism. And when we talk about homelessness statistics and all this stuff, okay, so what are we going to do about the homelessness crisis? I mean, we don't have time to sit here and, and, and say, you know, let's not be expedient about it. I mean, people need that though. You know, people, are, they need the urgency, I guess. That's what the sentiment is on the ground anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, you talk about homelessness, bring the troops home. They could build homes. Mm -hmm. we're paying them anyway here. oh let's let cj go because he's got a uh well, uh, clark your me. voice mike oh sorry is that better yep okay um my bad the uh the whole thing about uh you know framing issues giving it context is is really the most important thing um, that i'm picking up from the campaign um, you know, whoever came up with defund the police was a moron. And, and I can't help but think it was the opposition that planted that. You know? um, really, we should be talking about is optimizing the police, uh, making them better and more efficient and, and less volatile. You know, yes, demilitarization and, and what have you. But you brought up an interesting point about the, the qualified immun immunity, um, the fancy terms if you ask me. Um, so, you know, again, we I think it needs to be reframed. Yes, they've got this immunity, which is, 
you know, nobody's above the law. I mean, how did that ever get in there? You know, it, which is more evidence of a rigged system. Um, and, and maybe it's, and I don't totally understand the process completely, but maybe they've got to tell these guys that, look, if you make a mistake, you're not going to go to prison and get the death penalty. You know, um, I would never want to be a police officer or, or a first, first responder of any type because I have too much empathy. I have a photographic memory and not be good for me to do those kinds of things because I, I, I'd have a hard time getting, you know, my conscience and, and, and whatever. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, again, I think one of the things I've tried to help John with is we need to reframe these issues. Um, and, and it goes both ways. You know, I thought it was brilliant when the conservatives decided to stop calling it the estate tax and calling it the death tax. Because what they effectively did was take something that was very specific and only applied to a few people, very wealthy people, and, and reframed it so it's like, oh my gosh, everybody dies, so everybody's paying a death tax? That's not fair. So, you know, I, I support John with, you know, you could say he's, he's doing evasive answering. He's not really, you know, doing yes or no. Um, and I, I'd have to agree that we've really got to kick the discussion and the dialogue up a, a, a few intellectual notches to deal with complex situations. Um, you know, you look at the, the reality, you know, of our society, which is heavily based on science and, and mathematics, but yet most people, you know, have no clue about the science and the mathematics. They don't care. They're like, algebra didn't do anything for me. You know, occasionally I use geometry, you know, to, if I'm a carpenter to get a square corner, you know, 90 degrees. Oh, I get that. Um, but, you know, golly, we've, we've, uh, Carl Sagan and so many of these brilliant intellectuals have, have, you know, kind of tried to pave the way that you cannot deal with, with complex situations with a, with a yes or no answer. Um, you're just going to make you're probably going to make the problem worse if you're if you're working on a solution, um, and that's why we've got to come in. We've got to bring in the the dialogue, the conversations. You know, um, I read an interesting article the other day that uh, basically talked about politics, and that the whole intent of our system was for diverse people of different backgrounds, different industries, different ways of making a living to come together with diplomacy, statements, statesmanship, and, and the ability to compromise, to come up with the best solution. And, and what we've seen, you know, not to name names or blame anybody, but back in the 90s in Newt Gingrich, you know, never had a government shut down before. Every, I want everything my way or the highway, you know, and, and we're still seeing that today. That still looms over all of us, you know, the, the, uh, the debt ceiling. I mean, come on, what kind of construct is this? Um, and you can't say, well, do you like supporting the debt ceiling? Yes or no? Who can answer that legitimately? So, I, you know, there are a lot of gotcha questions and that's kind of what's happened with the formatting. So from a digital marketing standpoint, what I'm trying to help John with, and you know, like uh, his vision page, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bullet points and everything. We're, we're building out those to individual pages where you know ultimately we're going to have we're going to share where John is now, but you know the amazing thing about about being an intellectual and and uh, well maybe not an intellectual but being a liberal one of the one of the attributes of being a, lib a liberal is being able to change your mind when better information comes along rather than the old conservative stay the course resist change blah 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 we're in a point at this point of the of humanity where if if you know we don't get our act together it's game over i mean we're hitting we're coming up you know with environmental tipping points that, that are catastrophic there it's it's there's you know it's the point of no return and and i know people are like oh you know all this drama and blah 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 but as an environmental activist for over 40 years it's it's really frustrating to know the math and science and that two plus two always equals four you know, and, and this in this injection of alternative facts, really, two plus two will never equal five. 
member, not in reality, but in these in these conjured up, you know, separate realities that, that are being forced upon us by the media and everything else. And and people in isolation coming out of a pandemic where they're they're lonely, they're confused, they're alone. They they don't feel like they have equal rights and justice, you know. Um, all of these things are coming together right now at, at this point in time, and and I think we can do more harm than good with with a, a yes or no answers. They've got to be qualified, intelligent answers that hopefully ultimately lead to a solution. You know, we know we've got centralized control systems that have been put in place specifically, you know, to rig the system. And, and we've got to dismantle those. Or as I said previously, we've got to design a system, an alternative system that works better for everybody. And, you know, like they say, if you build it, they'll come. And that's what John and I and, and everybody else in the campaign hope to do is to try to inspire people to communicate, you know, put down your stereotype that I'm, a, I'm this or that, you know, look up in the dictionary what cognitive dissonance means you know, with all this identity stuff that we've got going on now and, and why it's so painful, you know, to change your mind about something and go, you know what, you were right all along. I don't know why I went down that path, but I did. But thank you for the kindness and the consideration and the time you've given me to explain it and bring me around. You can't accomplish those things with, you know, yes or no. Just can't. Yes. Um... This if this forum really tries to get to nuances and stuff, but um, I know with I know with the political cycles and stuff coming around, um, those those the questioning is definitely different. I mean, I feel like John and I we've had conversations to where we've talked more like on on a human to human level, and it's not me like interviewing a politician like that, but. I think it is important. I don't. I don't see these things as really yes or no's, but but I think it's important to clarify positions. And I think qualified immunity isn't that. I don't know. It, it, maybe that's where my positionality comes into that. It's just as a black American and um, seeing people that look like me constantly um, abused. And it's not just the television. That's just what they show on television. This happening. This is happening to white Americans and everybody. I mean, I don't think that people have a good feeling when it comes to policing. I'm not talking about the police in the mall or the police that are there when you're at the bar during the fight. I'm talking about when you're there in your backyard having a good time and people smell marijuana and people just absolutely, absolutely go ballistic because of what zip code you're in that's the kind of stuff that's happening and it's it's very contradictory to people especially when you see the dispensaries are opening across the country but then you say to yourself okay well why come people like me aren't getting the benefit of that when we're the ones that condemn most when it comes to that condemnation um those are the kinds of conflicts that black people have a lot of black people have when it comes to just simple police, and we don't have the same experience with police as other people, we just don't. Um, and I know that that goes into socioeconomics too, because a lot of white communities have problems with police in their areas. And it's a class struggle, I completely agree with that, but people don't seem to be lining those two together, regardless of it being white people or black people or poor people or whatever, the police are protecting the protected class, which is the 1%. And I can see that correlation. And it seems like your campaign can see that correlation too. But the immunity thing is put into context. I'm asking that question within the context of what we already know about the system, the corrupt system that we've talked about. So that's why I think people are wanting a yes or no to sort of get an affirmation as to where the campaign is when it comes to legalizing cannabis in the qualified immunity, in the wars and stuff. I, I don't think it has to be like a yes, no, like a simple question, but it, but there needs to be some sort of an explanation that leads to a yes and no. And, and maybe that it, maybe I am simplifying it by saying that it is a yes, no to begin with, but I don't think qualified immunity is that hard. I think that's a yes, no question, at least from my vantage point, because that does go into the defund the police situation 
and you don't even have to call it to fund the police. Because when you end the qualified immunity, that is a step leading into, okay, well, people are not going to be wanting to be police as much, maybe. Especially with these quote unquote bad apples, they're not going to be wanting to join the police academies if they know that there are consequences behind their bad behavior. So of course not. It is de-incentivizing people becoming police. So if you want to be a cop, if you want to be a, a responsible cop, then you know that that's in place. Okay, maybe I'll do it. But you already know what's up front. I agree well, with you, uh, and and I do get your point. Um, so I would say the answer to all your questions is yes, but it's a qualified yes. Right. It's yes. It's always yes. I mean, I, you know, if it's a step in the right direction, it's yes. But then I want to say, but let's talk about the details. Tell me exactly how you would do it, right? Um, and so, I mean, but then even that sounds like a little bit like I'm evading. And I'm not trying to evade any of the questions. I, I just want people to recognize that these are complex issues. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and, 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 and you can't silo everything. You can't have education. We're going to attack education. We're going to throw money at education. We're going to attack student debt. We're going to throw money at student debt. Right. We're going to attack military. <laughs> We're going to, you know, as if you could, as if you could correct what's going on in our society and in our culture by just doing that, it, it, it doesn't right. work. Um, so what I, the only thing I want to do is try to say that these, we have to think in terms of integration. OK, in the computer industry uh, back in the 80s, they had what they called best of breed software packages. You'd have an accounts receivable and you'd have an accounts payable system. You'd have a warehousing system. They were silos. They were all separate. They didn't talk to each other. OK, so let's suppose that you have a, uh, you know, an accounts receivable system where your customer's name uh, CJ wrap. And then over in the billing system, it's Clark rep. Now, how does the person get a report to understand their relationship with CJ slash Clark rep, right? So they realize we need a single integrated database. We only need one Clark rep in there. And we're either gonna call him CJ or we're gonna call him Clark, but it's gonna be consistent. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so then they could understand their business and they could get better performance. So that's the approach when it comes to government and government services. Uh, and, and it's why we need to redesign and integrate these services. So I would re restructure the entire social service network around, it all has to come to human health and development for our children, our families, communities, all the rest, right? And, and so we have, people who are capable of doing this when the when the when the secretary of transportation isn't communicating with the secretary of education because they're connected how do these kids get to the schools how do they get to the right schools at the right time see even those connect right and what about that child's health director of health and human services he's got to be involved in that conversation so when we develop a solution. It's a comprehensive, integrated solution with the individual being at the center. So we have a constitution. We have a bill of rights. We have the ideal in place, but we're not practicing it in a way that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't know, does, does that make sense? So the answer to all of your questions is yes, but it's a qualified yes. I, I want to simply say it's not as simple. You know, if, if I just did the one thing, and it might be the right thing, uh, it might be that this is the thing that I can do right now that's going to help, and it's a step in the right direction. And in that case, if there's a legislative initiative toward that, I'd probably say yes, and I would probably sign it, right? Because it's better than what we were doing. It may not be exactly where we want to go over the long haul. So there will be those things. I'm always for taking a step in the right direction, but it may not be the ultimate answer where we want to go. Um, and it's not easy to change a big, massive system. It takes a, and, but, but what you do want to have a lot of different voices. You want to get all those perspectives so that when you come up with a solution, you got people bought into it, mm -hmm. you know? 
Um, if, if, if I create a solution and only half the population's bought into it, you can see how that's gonna end up with tension in the society. And that's gonna be destructive. All those tensions, we have to work in ways that we can cooperate and collaborate. So it takes a lot of discussion to get people to buy in. Like, like I would turn around and you say, uh, you say something like, um, oh, I'm for uh, ending qualified immunity. I would say, uh, what does that, show me the legislation. Mm -hmm. Let's read the specifics. Show me what that looks like exactly. And we could say, yes, this probably won't solve all the problem. We might agree that that's the best way to go. But I, I think it's worth having the conversation. Um, I, I don't necessarily, and, and first of all, don't forget that the president, if you're a real leader, you're bringing people in. You don't have all the answers. And so a real leader unites people. A real leader brings people together. If a leader takes actions that divide us against our common interests, that's not a leader. It's a, it might be, but he's a failed leader. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what we have now. See, if, if Biden does something, you know, even if it's a good next step, just because he's, you know, if he divides the nation and people are fighting each other in the streets over it, is that a win? Wouldn't it be better to take a little longer and have the discussion, make sure we bring people together? Isn't that what leaders actually are supposed to do? You're the head of your family. What is it like in your family when they're divided against each other? Working against their, your common family interests. You know that doesn't work. You could step down with the iron fist and say, I'm the dad, I'm bringing the money, it's gonna be my way or the highway. You go to your room, you go to your room. You could run your family like that. But, you know, that's not teaching your children how to think. That's teaching them how to take orders, how to obey. And you know, because you're an educated guy, that what we really want to do is get people engaged and teach our children how to think, how to think rationally, how to think critically. So, so that, that requires big, open, public conversation. It requires transparency in government. Everybody says they want a transparent government. Listen. If there's somebody in the world doing something or in the government, I would celebrate people that, that, that come forward and say, here's some, somebody in our agency not doing the right thing and exposing it. I would celebrate that. I would set up a system where we would have an investigative unit to go down and, and check it out and verify it. But I would encourage whistleblowers, not punish them. Currently, whether that's a Republican or a Democrat, Julian Assange, through both administrations, going all the way back to Obama, three different administrations, he's still in jail. For, for what? For telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Whoa. When the truth is a punishable event and a truth teller is punished rather than the people that committed the crime he exposed, mm -hmm. you know you've got a corrupt system, right? And so... This is why the process is so important, bringing people in, being open and exclusive. If, if somebody is giving you a yes or no simple answer, you're just checking off a box. Yeah, that may work for some people because I understand the uh, uh, American people are stressed. They don't have time to look at the details, right? But this is where everybody can do something, no matter how little it is, you might say, John, I'll sign up for your ballot access coalition. I think it's a good plan, but I don't have the time. What I will do is when the ballot is released in my state to get you on a ballot, I'll sign it. That may be the extent of what they can do. Mm -hmm. Some people may say, I can't contribute anything to your campaign to help you get the message out. I don't have the resource. I can barely put food on the table, or maybe it's even worse for them, right? But other people, yeah, I've got the resource and money. I'm willing to contribute right? I only take contributions from individuals. So the, my campaign is completely different from what you get out of the two major parties. And even out of the third parties, uh, I don't have any conflict with any internal party. I'm not a part of a tribe. Mm -hmm. The only tribe I'm a part of is the tribe called humanity, the tribe called, and you can boil I'm an American, right? So it isn't, if I thought America first was the answer, I would be saying it. I think it's humanity first. 
we have to take care of one another here at home. That's true, but we can't do it at the expense of other people, mm -hmm. right? Because ultimately that's going to come back. And you know, if you've ever lived in a community and let's say you have a neighbor that is just, you know, he's uh, uh, not well-educated, maybe he's ignorant, maybe he's destructive, how that impacts your life, having a neighbor that way, right? So we really have to learn how to cooperate and collaborate at all levels. And that's, and that's changing the culture. And that's what leaders are, are good leaders are, are all about. Bringing people together, helping to educate, helping to smooth out the rough edges, the dysfunction and the, the, and the tension. You want to reduce the tension. People that are anxious and tense can't think straight. I, I, I was going to ask um, CJ and yourself, like, if you all had any departing words, like for my audience, like if there's like a message that you want my audience to kind of, you know, uh, get, I guess, resonate in their minds before we um, end the conversation. And what would be the quickest, most direct way for an audience member or a listener, if they had a question for you or they wanted to keep in touch with you, how would they do that? Uh, I'll let CJ go first. Uh, well, we're, uh, we're developing uh, our technology uh, to to be able to, you know, basically do what you're doing, Kiko. Um, we're going to do, you know, live broadcasts, uh, question and answers, discussion forums. Um, again, I avoid the, the term, just like John does, debate, uh, because where we are at this point in time, both kind of reiterated, there really are no yes and no answer problems that we're facing. Um, got to We've got to go to that next level. We've got to kind of be a little bit more intellectual. And that's, and that's one of those things that we're dealing as a, as a dominant society right now is, is this anti-intellectualism that, that my beliefs are, are just as valid as, as your science and mathematics, you know, this whole alternative universe, you know. Um, but, but the things, you know, the next thing we're going to do too is, is start kind of breadcrumbing and, and putting out rewards. Um, you know, we talked earlier about transportation. Um, John was referring to ride sharing, which is which is really would be good for the planet. Uh, but there's also a, a current trend: e-bikes are becoming extremely popular, and we need infrastructure for that. And that can easily be done. And sometimes it's just a matter of changing the flow of traffic and painting lines on the street. You know, we're not talking huge budgets here. People are embracing e-bikes. And the next level where I personally think that automated uh, automation and, and AI can come in and play a huge part is EVITALs, electronic, or excuse me, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. You know, my gosh, if, if we could have those on a ride share basis, you know, they're calling them taxis, right? Because the current lexicon for the average person is, you know, limited. They don't. I've said Eva told the people and are like, what? What's that? Um, but anyway, that that potential. So there's the next level. And I think it's a campaign to to do that breadcrumbing and kind of raise the bar and, and set some goals and share some ideas of what kind of society and technological world we want to create. You know, do we want more consolidation of wealth and power for the few at the expense of the many? No, that's not working. We've got to have, you know. Education, healthcare, uh, the basics covered, you know, food, shelter, you know, um, and again, the, the potential for de de uh, decentralization to make communities stronger and self sufficient. Um, I give a speech about uh, how the environmental movement, the environmental movement, to the green movement, to the sustainable movement. And I'm proposing that we start focusing on the self sufficiency or self reliant. Movement where every structure becomes energy self-sufficient with you know improving the efficiency, uh, the utilization of, of uh, green technology, renewable energy, solar, wind, micro hydro, whatever. And and rather than you know taking, I've heard the concept of you know if we just used one eighth of the Sahara Desert, we could provide all the energy for the whole world. Well, you know what that is? That's more consolidation of wealth and power for the few at the expense of the many. Now you only have one resource, one place you can buy your energy from, and they control the market. Yes, we gotta we gotta break it down. Uh, antitrust. I know I got off on tangents and whatever, but 
John inspires me and the opportunity to to help and and you know get get ideas out there and get people talking. Um, and and I'm trying to do things you know for to get people to participate. Even if all you want to do is is like things on Facebook and share memes, well, the campaign is setting up to to be able to do that to get the word out and get people thinking and talking. And um, at some point, we're going to encourage um, all all kinds of of call in discussions and everything. It's one of the reasons why I'm supporting um, John and and Jason, who's who's our our, our super cool techie on the backside. Uh, he's he's working with John to to set up all this potential um, that you know yeah we need help we need donations to do more press releases and get the word out and get people's attention so they can participate you know we're not talking about a spectator sport here uh, with this type of campaign with the ballot access initiative uh, the ballot access coalition we need people out there getting petitions signed at some point. But the beautiful idea of the concept, which I refer to as John's legacy project, is that if you've got one petition and somebody's interested in supporting nonpartisan independence, well, here's a presidential candidate, here's a senator in your state, here's two representatives, here's the mayor and a city council member. Mm -hmm. Will you sign? Will you help us get these people on the ballot so that you actually have, are able to exercise your so-called freedom by having good choices? rather than limited choices. So it's, you know, I, I know I got way off the, out into the weeds no, on, on answering this, but um, there's so much to share. And um, a guy like me is, is you know, it's it's a challenge to be able to get to get it all organized and get it out there and present it in a way that, that people can actually digest it. And yes, yeah, so, you know, we're gonna take the, the vision page the individual bullet points, or you could call it the platform, and we're going to elaborate on these things. Um, and and this is a great this is a great experience. Um, thank you very much, Kiko, because um, we're the proof in the pudding is right here with what we're doing. We're three human beings with different perspectives, different life experience, but yet here we are talking and sharing, and and we have far more in common than we have differences. You know. And that's that's really the essence of this campaign is to is to unite people. You know, let's talk about the things that that we all have in common, rather than that one weird little thing that you know is our the burr under our saddle today. You know, what's what's the burr going to be tomorrow? You know, you got all kinds of focus groups and and uh, think tanks working on that. Believe me, right now <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> and and you know, at my goal or what would really make me happy is when we get on the radar enough, if they actually have to respond to what we're trying to do and what we're saying, um, and, and that is the disruption. You know, and a lot of times people think disrupt, being disruptive is bad and negative, but you know what? Sometimes it takes that one guy, and, and, you know, I have a photographic memory and what popped into my mind was there's this black and white image of, of all these people giving the sick hollow, you know, and, and, uh, Nazi Germany, and there's this one guy sitting there like this, <laughs> and and the caption in the meme is "Be this guy," you know, be that one guy. And what we hope to do is is open up a forum for people to be engaged and to participate, and have it run in such a way that it's okay to disagree, but you know, you still have to be civil, you still have to be kind, you know. You want to start yelling at somebody and using profanity? No, we're not going to tolerate that anymore. Um, that is that's negative disruption. Um, so it's it's uh, it's quite literally throwing throwing water on the fire. In some cases, is what we want to do, and that's that's a form of disruption too. You just you just disrupted the burning process. Okay, so mm -hmm. over here we might be starting fires, and over here we might be you know getting the fire hoses out. <laughs> yes. But that that's the beauty of the campaign. And the only way we can really be effective is with participation at any level, every level that, that people want to do. You know, do we want huge donors? Are we going to develop a pack? No. And and Bernie proved that you don't need to do that. 
you know, seven dollars. You have seven dollars, you know, it's it's kind of like the old hippies in the panhandles, you know, spare change, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and um, but I think we can take it and we can we can leverage the the support and participation and and the style. And I would say it all boils down to leadership by example. Um, and that's another reason why I'm with John's campaign is he's demonstrated to me that he's got the, a huge potential for people to participate because he leaves that door open. You know, the, the definitive uh, two-party system, you know, the yes or no, the planks and everything else. I think it all, it all feeds into the, the control and, and the manipulation of the population, the masses. You know, um, all the distractions, the class war, this, that, everything else. Watch this hand over here while this hand takes your pocket. And we got to get away from that system. Um, just, you know, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's leadership by example um, and, and following through and, and, and communication. Communication is super critical. And, and obviously that's one of the areas that, that falls into my responsibility. Uh, the websites are a good start. What we're going to do with social media is a good start. Um, and I think the next the next stage where, you know, I don't know what John's capability will be. I mean, theoretically, we're going to set up a system that John could be available every night, you know, from six to seven. And maybe we'll develop a booking, you know, registration deal where uh, we have people apply, you know. Which I don't like filters. You know, it sounds like a form of censorship, and you know we're going to pick and choose. Uh, I don't think so. We don't have the sophisticated technology to you know do the socioeconomic crap that, that Google can and Facebook can. You know, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't ask them for their help because more than likely it's going to be tainted data anyway, manipulated data. But that's our goal. That's the next level, the next stage of the campaign is to actually get actually get participation. Um, and and at the at the grassroots level, this is a grassroots campaign. Uh, the, the communication and technology capabilities are out there. They just have to be used. And and the biggest part of that usership is people willing to participate. Um, even if it's only once, you know, come online when we get things going and ask John a question. And and what an amazing thing. How historical at some point to be able to look back and say, I asked John that question and I'm a part of the movement and I've made a contribution. I've made a positive contribution to society, my community and my family specifically because the information has been presented in such a way that it makes sense. It's not just a simple yes or no. Yes, it's it's incremental steps that have to be made. It's a process, you know. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, is it is this a one election cycle phenomena? No, this is you know. Uh, I was personally involved with the legalization of marijuana here in Colorado as a digital marketeer. Um, it was great once we finally got it legalized. But I remember calling up police chiefs around the country for an organization called Leak. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, leaders, what was it? Leader, law enforcement against prohibition. And um, some of the responses that I had were amazing. These guys, you know, the commonality, just by, by having a conversation and out of the blue and being able to get through, because I've, I've done digital marketing and marketeer, right? I know how to get past the gatekeepers. And talking with some of these guys, I'm not going to name names or locations, but they said, you know, it's pathetic the amount of time we spend this on this pretty petty marijuana stuff busting kids when there's people out there you know committing robbery rape murder theft white collar crime i mean we can't touch i that's part of this the way the system's set up we can't touch white collar crime because the way the system works it's like oh look at those little people down there we gotta get those little people they're the real problem it's it's the guys in suits and ties that are that are you know, and they have no accountability. And again, it's back around to qualified immunity. What you're really talking about is accountability. And that is, is equal rights and justice right there. Equal accountability is equal rights and justice. And, and yes, 
do the police have equal rights and justice? Hell no, they've got an unfair advantage. Um, do the, does the media and the two party system, is that, is that equal rights and justice? Hell no, it's a rigged system to consolidate wealth and power for the few at the expense of the many and maintain that and make it worse, you know? Let's bring authoritarianism, authoritarianism is in, into it, you know, it's uh, Christian nationalism. You know, there's only one religion that you can have. You know, the books, look at what they're doing with books, you know, rather than teaching critical thinking, let's just remove what we don't agree with, you know? They say, oh, we're anti-censorship. Well, what are you gonna do next? Burn those books that you confiscated? Um, you know, and we've got to get people talking about this and, and participating. And uh, something about one-on-one, -on -one, you know, yes, I know technology is, is okay, but you and I and John are having a, a, an amazing conversation right here that other people can listen into. In fact, I know that you got an ability for anybody out there if they wanted to notify you and you could let them in and they could ask John a question. That's where we want to go with it rather than, you know, campaign rallies. Um, right. We're going to use, we're right. going to use, you know, and, and throwing the crowd red meat, you know, oh, we don't like this person and because of this and that and, you know, all that negative energy. Have you ever noticed that most campaign rallies, it, it's, it's so much negativity. It's straw man, you know, and we're going to do this to them and uh you know uh, all the all the terminology that has come into our, our lexicon and our our vocabulary in the past few years alternative facts they reframed yeah. lying that's what they did they reframed telling lies well we have alternative facts no we have lies because we don't agree with reality well, you know, there is one big part of this that we didn't cover, and uh, um, I alluded to it a little bit, but, uh, you know, first of all, I mean, Kiko, I'd like to thank you very much for providing the platform, um, and I've watched some of your other videos that you do. I, I, I think what you're doing is a real public service, to be honest with you, you and a lot of other people who engage in, uh, in these podcasts, uh, but uh, in our campaign, we don't... Uh, we don't want to blame individuals for the problem because one of the big things that we um, like to impress on others who do blame people, uh, Warren Buffett happens to be very successful in the capitalist system. He does what the system demands and he made he's made a lot of money. He's very good at it. I don't view him as a bad guy. I don't want to um, blame him. I'd actually like to engage with him and bring him in and talk about new alternatives and new solutions. I think he's a brilliant guy in many, many ways, right? So it, it doesn't work when you start blaming other people. Uh, you need to engage everybody and you need to bring them in to, to solve the problems that we have. Uh, so we all operate within the context of a system and we do things that we have to do to survive. And I talked uh, a little bit, alluded to it when we talked about the military and they have to build bombs. We, they have to go to war and blow up bombs so that they can build more and keep us employed. So it makes no sense in the context of a system to blame these individual people. They have to operate, they have to survive and they're doing their best. So uh, I guess my parting words is, uh, you know, let's come together, let's stop blaming one another, let's engage and talk, uh, much like Clark said. Um, the, the blame game is destructive. It doesn't do any good and it doesn't solve any problems. And there's way too much of that going on uh, across the spectrum, across the political spectrum, and even within communities and families. Let's start uh, learning how to communicate effectively, talk to one another. Let's start loving one another. We deserve to love one another. We're all worthy. Every one of us is worthy. And so um, I guess th I'd like to maybe end with that, um, if you don't mind. Beautiful people, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation with John Stasevich and CJ Rapp and Jason Page is in the background, <laughs> but they're all on the team too. Um, I appreciate you all coming on the forum and um, I just want to give my listeners an, um, a heads up. I'm going to drop some names that are going to be on the forum within the next month and two months. Uh, Brian Tui is actually going to be on tomorrow. We're going to talk about his book, The Fix is In. Jack Rasmus is going to join us on Monday to talk about the Ukraine-Russia situation. We actually got three contributors from the 
Splash Point in Ukraine is the name of the book 2014. If you want to get a, an alternative view on what's going on right now in that part of the world, uh, Matthew T. Witt is also going to join us to talk about that book and also um, Jeffrey Summers as well. So those three professors and um, commentators are all gonna come on the forum to talk about the Ukraine-Russia situation. My personal friend, Jehar Kervin from University of Tennessee, Knoxville, he's now at McDaniel College in Maryland. He's gonna talk about Cameroon and um, relationships between Arabs and black Africans. We're gonna talk a lot about um, some of his endeavors right now and his dissertation that he wrote. We have Michael Sparkman coming down to talk about videography. We have my dad coming on um, to talk about politics and his um, um, political influences and just his growth over the years. Norman Finkelstein is coming on as well to talk about his new book that he released. Dawn Duke, my dissertation director, is coming on with three other people to discuss her new book that just got released in January. So we have a ton of people on the forum coming on. Uh, some people are known, some lesser known, but regardless, we're going to have more great conversations down the road. And John, CJ, and Jason, I appreciate you all again coming onto the forum. And something tells me I'm going to see you all relatively soon. So <laughs> we'll just keep the audience guessing into what that possibility could be. So regardless, beautiful people have a great afternoon, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your days. Cheers. Thank you.